Great to see you, sir. And uh, we're rolling. And um, comment your presentation. Okay, I, I, I will give my best. And welcome to Harold. Um, as you heard, I'm coming from Germany. And um, I did science half of my life, and I worked as a journalist the other half of uh, my life, writing articles, books, uh, for about one and a half years in film business. So I, I saw a little bit of the world and many, many different topics, so I'm a little bit trained in uh, interconnecting and um, understanding more, more complicated fields of research. This is maybe my, my core quality. And uh, I started to deal with environmental monitoring when I was in Norway. Actually, I was working in Norway in the field of electrosensitivity for a company uh, supplying measuring materi material like this one and shielding materials and giving courses for the people to understand what is happening if somebody becomes electrosensitive. And when I was there, I, I kind of was asked to look at chemical analysis of uh, dying plants and the rainwater that caused the plant death and soil samples because the farmers realized they're losing parts of their harvest that year. It was 2012, but they didn't know why. So they went to the labs and then they had the lab results and didn't, they couldn't read it. They saw values, but they didn't even know what should have been on these papers. So they addressed me as a little bit crazy scientist from Germany and asked for help. And since then, I'm working on this chemtrail topic. And um, I think we looked through it now. It, it took quite a while to understand the different, uh, let's say, the different agendas behind it, because it is not a single agenda. It's not a single group that has interests and is doing something to get what they want. It is a, it is a kind of onion-like structure of different groups who have different interests and uh, the longer you research on the topic um, the more layers you discover so what what i'm trying to do today is kind of to dive through this lay onion like structure and to try to give you a picture of those different agendas behind camp training there are two things i'm not going to do and where i really would ask everybody who is discussing the topic don't stare into the sky and try to figure out whether the, the thing you see is a chemtrail or a contrail. It leads to nothing. It's a fruitless discussion, and we cannot solve this from down here. You cannot grab the stuff up there. You cannot make a chemical analysis. Just staring it at it is hopeless. And the other thing that um, took me about one year, one lost year, is to deal with chemical analysis. This has one, one reason. If you make, make chemical analysis, you take a substance and dilute it in acids, and then whatever goes is dissolved by the acid can be analyzed. And what you get is metal values. You don't have a clue, if you d did that, about the chemistry you analyzed or the crystal structure you analyzed, because everything that is dissolved is dissolved, is gone, and all you have is the metal. This is one problem. You don't really see what you have. And the other problem is that not everything is soluble in acids. And actually, the entire core technologies that we could discover later, if you check them in the lab, they are all completely resistant to acids. So there's no chance to get the real McCoy by chemical analysis. So those are two things I'm going to completely skip, also out of time reasons. Um, I want to enter the entire picture from a different angle for today. And um, this is if, if, if we have somebody who, who is doing things in secret. It's not published in the newspapers, he will not talk about it in public. Uh, then you have the other side of the game that somebody is trying to figure out what is happening. And then there comes this ugly word, conspiracy theory and uh, one feels isolated. Here, okay. Thank you. Um, no, I dropped it. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, if, if you're confronted with this thing um, that you might be a conspiracy theorist, then this is something emotional. Nobody wants to stand outside society. Nobody wants to be the weird guy. So this is basically an ugly argument that is used to make people shut up. So um, this can be fought with uh, a few very, very not rational, just clever uh, moves. Uh, we want to talk about chemtrails. So the first question that comes up to my mind is, where does this word come from? And this is a question that is beyond theory, because you can find out where the word comes from. And it comes from soldiers of the US Army, mostly US Air Force, um, who brought this word into the English language, because they were sitting at the US Air Force Academy um, attending classes of the chemical faculty and one of the classes is the chemtrail class. This is kind of when you study at this university, the class where you learn how to make chemtrails. Yeah. This doesn't touch the question, do chemtrails exist up in the sky or not? The only thing we can answer by looking at this chemtrail class is um, we can see this is a military technology we don't know if it is applied or not, but we can study the technology because it's taught at the university. And this manuscript is a little bit hard to read. It's like 260 pages, round about that. And uh, basically it's examination questionnaires. So there's no, not a single answer in it, but there are thousands of questions. And when you take this manuscript and answer all the questions from these examinations, then you gather the knowledge and from this knowledge, like with a jigsaw puzzle, you can back engineer what chemtrailing is. And um, basically the topics they are dealing with is um, aluminum co coating of plastic surfaces is a big issue. Uh, and the synthesis of nylon, nylon fibers especially. This is one part of this uh, chemtrail class. And if you want to know what this is good for, there's one military application called spoofer sprays. These are aluminum coated nylon fibers and they use it to hide planes from radar detection. This is not a big secret. It is official, officially admitted by state authorities that at certain NATO maneuvers in the sky, they use these spoofer sprays to train to hide airplanes. So this is one part that is described in this manuscript. The other half is a little bit more difficult to read and to analyze. Uh, it very, very much looks like that they are talking about spray pyrolysis, which is the production of crystalline nanoparticles in a combustion process. This is something that is done in industry when you want to produce certain types of nanoparticles. It is a very cheap and very efficient way to pr produce nanoparticles. And there are two ways in industry and in this manuscript. Uh, one possibility is you take like metal salts that you can solute in water. And then you take this water and run it through an um, ultrasound nozzle that is kind of turning it into millions of very, very small droplets. And these droplets are brought into a flame. And then the water evaporates and the, the salt content of the little, little droplet forms a small dust particle. And if the flame is hot enough, it will eventually melt and recrystallize. And depending on the temperature and on the uh, droplet sizes, you can create crystalline particles, you can create amorphous particles. This is one possibility that is within the uh, range of spray pyrolysis. The other possibility is not to use water, but to use directly use combust combustible liquids like methane or whatever. I think methane is within the US military the first choice. And then you, you don't even need an, a secondary ultrasound nozzle. You can use the ultrasound nozzles that create the vapor that is burned within a jet engine. Uh, so this is basically the, basically the chemical and technical knowledge that is taught in the chemtrail class. So we get a first idea what this technology is about. Um, 
We still don't know if it is used regularly, if it is used sometimes, if this is something that uh, is meant for wartime and in, in peacetime, nobody even touches these technologies. We just learned something about the technology. Now, um, when, when, when you see how successful this way of looking at things is, you know, we answered many questions where other people uh, were searching, talking, discussing years and years and came to no fruitful conclusions. There's something that is very, very intelligent. If you have somebody that might have plans he doesn't want you to know, it is a very good thing to go to the places where these people are alone among each other and talk about what they do. Yeah? Then you can listen and understand what they plan. Actually, there's no other way to, to find out what's happening. So I started to get interested in internal papers of certain agencies. And uh, there was one stupid mistake done by some uh, uh, network specialists in NASA. They published an internal paper. I think it's like 12, 15 years ago. Uh, that was classified and it appeared for two days uh, in the public domain of the main NASA website. And some people just by inc incident found it and copied the paper. And since then, actually this is public domain. It's brought out every now and then, it's discussed by people every now and then. Um, it's not like, the, like a text that is giving a full description of what they are doing. Basically it's just a PowerPoint that um, is displaying certain core terminologies. This is the paper in the original form and the title is a little bit funny. It's Future Strategic Issues for Future Warfare and they project this on the year 2025 as if they talk about future technologies. And then you have a very big, very small subtitle, The Future is Now. Now I'm a bit confused. Is it now or is it in 15, 20 years that this is going to be brought out. If you go into the entire thing, you find a number of irritating um, statements. This is kind of the second page, the little one on top. Bots, Borgs and humans, welcome to the future. Bots are is short term for nanobots, nanorobots. Borgs is a term coming from s the, the uh, um, um, st Star Wars? No, not Star Wars. The Star Trek uh, s uh, filming. It's the species that is assimilating other species by turning them into half computer, half, half being. And humans, I guess they mean themselves, the one who are not affected by those games and rule the entire thing afterwards. And they, they just name a number of technologies that are going to be used in future wars. And they, they explicitly say the war of the future is not in between countries. They expect to have a world government. So the war happening on this planet is between the government and the normal people. And this completely different type of war will need completely different weapons. And then they list all those weapons. And um, um, there are certain things that are solved for them on nano level, on the level of nanoparticles, sensor swarms. If you have the nanoparticles in the air, it's a swarm. And it has smart dust. This is what something uh, um, we will find later in, in the details we found in the environment. Uh, nanotags, things that are placed within the human body to give them opportunity to track you down every single second and read out what you think and what you feel. And something that is not explained in this paper, they call it co-opted insects, whatever this is. I just want to point out at this moment that this is in their paper because we're going to find things that are going very much to remind us of these words. Um, other things in this paper that are worth mentioning, uh, weapons that are apparently legal. Yeah, they are talking about weapons that are hidden somewhere in the civil domain. Everybody is dealing with them, everybody is using them, and one of them is the microwave. 
Microwave is used for mobile phones, it's used for smart meters, it's used for uh, wireless LAN connections, and we're surrounded by um, microwaves, and they enter our body, and we think this is just a side effect of technical applications. But NASA classifies microwaves as a non-lethal weapon that is apparently legal. And um, they also name the uh, effect of those weapons. It's behavioral performance decrements, cyrus, gross alteration in brain function, uh, 30%, 30 to 100% increase in brain flow, in, br in, in blood flow in the brain, and uh, also lethal effects that come over the time. So this is weapons brought out on mankind that NASA is opening, openly talking about, just projecting it in the paper to the future. And we are falling for this. We, we think it's something clever to have a mobile on your head half, half of the day. Um, what they also have, and uh, this is something that refers to Kara's work, is uh, explosive microdust that can, that can be intelligently moved through the air to certain points, to certain areas. You can upconcentrate it and form, a, form an explosive lens, and it can can also go intentionally into human beings to kill them from inside. They say that it's, it's clever enough, the system, to go into underground facilities with the dust, with the explosive dust, to, um, to access people who are hiding down there. Um, so this is basically this NASA document that is giving a kind of abstract picture what could be airborne in the future, or maybe, because of the future is now, could be airborne, airborne already today. Um, the next possibility to find out what is happening is to talk to whistleblowers. And there are not many whistleblowers around who really uh, reveal essential facts. We have People like um, um, WikiLeaks, what's his name, uh, Julian Assange. If you look who his lawyer is, it's the same lawyer that is serving the Rothschild family. And he's got massive attention by the state media. It was like, like building up a hero, you know. He's fucking two blonde Scandinavian girls. What a nice guy, you know. And then he's everybody's heroes and then he's allowed to talk about certain things. And if you exactly look at the things he put into public, somehow it was serving the interests of the people in power. Now we have the other guy from the United States, the NASA guy, um, Snowden. What does he do? He's telling us that the intelligence community is listening to phone calls. This is something I know from the 1920s, that this is what the people do. And here and there he's dropping some things, but it's not ex actually the thing that is published on, on mainstream media. Uh, but mainstream media is carrying him and Putin is offering him asyl asylum. But I think, okay, I'm, I'm revealing other things and nobody ever offered me asylum and not a single newspaper is printing my truth. So there must be something wrong about these people. Uh, but sometimes you get whistleblowers who don't get public attention. And uh, they deliver papers, and those papers are kind of interesting. There's one paper I want to mention that is handed around in Germany because it's written in German. And the guy was the technical director of an institute that was working on smart dust. And he suffered from cancer, and he had a kind of, I don't know, three, four months to live before the cancer uh, would kill him. And he regretted the things he did during his life. He realized that the money he got for it was not really worth anything. And um, that the things he did were not really friendly. And he basically put part of the technical uh, concept uh, on paper. 
uh, gave enough information to make it possible to prove that it uh, exists. And um, what he described basically was based on maybe th this is something I this is not for, for, for this audience. This is something that is going to the intelligence community that for sure is going to listen to this lecture as well. Uh, the name of the project is Rabe Neu in German. Translated, it would be Raven New, so that you know that we know what you do. And um, the guy revealed a few things about this project that even the people in the project do not know. And this is the message that is now going to to the intelligence community, because you should know what is wrong about this project. So what, what he did, he's talking about genetic engineering. And uh, before I, I, I would like to, to mention a few things that he mentioned, I would like to give you an overview about the possibilities in genetic engineering that are publicly known. Not to everybody, but it is public domain. So. Um, in genetic engineering, you can create DNA, which is the full genetic information, that, like it is in the cell, and you can split this thing into half and have kind of half of the structure, only one side of it, the spiral, and this is RNA. And uh, in genetic engineering, it is very clever to use RNA because it has the full functionality, but it doesn't spoil the next generation. So this is something they really like to work on because you can manipulate without destroying and without risking the future. If you look at DNA and RNA, there are a number of different functions to it. Um, one function is that um, these um, fragments of RNA, DNA produce light of certain qualities. This is connected, it's called optogenetics, the entire field of research. And it is the, the teaching about how the genetics produce biophotons and produce the light body of a being. This is kind of the, the blueprint that is uh, controlling the, the building up of forms, the morphogenetic field that, that is giving us the structure we, we, we are. So this is all done by, by this DNA. And uh, if you synthesize DNA, this is done by printing today. You write down the, the code you want to produce, and then this, this is going into a DNA or RNA printing machine. So you can define every single base pair of the structure and print it out. So what they do is one of the fields is optogenetics to, to, to invent and produce little fragments of RNA, DNA that produce light. The second thing is, this, and the second natural function of DNA is to produce substances. These parts of the DNA are producing RNA, the RNA is producing proteins, and the proteins start to build up the matter that the body is built out of. And also, like, um, healing substances and poisons can be produced by cells. And this is one function embedded in a certain span of this DNA. So this is something they, they, they say, th there's medicine, for example, uh, artemisine. It's very, very expensive to extract it from plants. So they just extract the little portion of the uh, genetic information that is doing this substance and insert it into some microbes and then can they, they can cr create artemisine in big amounts. This is medicine, how, how, how they work. So we have light producing things and we have substance pr producing things. And then there's a new field of research. They realize that the base pairs can be mounted into a chain in a way that functions like a computer, like a logical element. And this is some, if you visualize this, it's like, like the old method with telephones uh, when you were dialing with sound. Um, every bass pair has a, own, ha has a resonance frequency. It's somewhere in the terahertz range. And if you hit the right frequency, it is opening like a conducting, conducting, uh, light conducting unit. 
Um, and if you have a chain of these base pairs that react on different frequencies, you need a, um, a sequence of sounds to open all the fragments to make the entire thing conducted. So it goes like do 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 do, and then the next part of the genetic thing is activated to either produce light or to produce poison. And this is something beautiful uh, out of their view of the world because if you bring this RNA or DNA into the human body, you can kind of take a radio signal and activate it from outside to produce any substance you want or to produce any light you want. Light is emotion, light is thought, light is everything. Everything we sense as experience of ourselves. And a substance can do everything with us. It can poison us slowly, it, is kill, it, it can kill us immediately. Um, and this is controllable by radio frequencies without risking that it is triggered without anyone to want it being triggered. And the guy said, actually, we, kn we know that this is dangerous to bring this out, so we, that was in the papers, so we introduced uh, deactivate, de deactivation code, like a, a, a line of, of sounds that is completely taking the system out and, uh, so that it cannot be abused by other entities. This is what he said. And he said this is airborne since 2003 in Europe. And he said that the second... War, the last war in Iraq was only done to test the system. It was the only real reason for the war. Um, this is what he wanted to tell us, or f from my point of view, the important stuff. Then he said some things aside that I counted to be very, very important. I don't think he did. He said they spent half a year and $10 billion to optimize the cluster topology. And this is something that I guess says nothing to anyone here, but if you're in, into the topic, if it's like having a, a virus and you want to bring the virus into a human being to have them infected with this, cluster topology is of no interest. You need to think about cluster topologies if you want to have this RNA or DNA clusters carry intelligence, carry soul, carry an artificial life form. Then it makes sense. And if you, if you, if you uh, picture this, we are infected with this RNA, and the RNA is forming a cluster of one millimeter, one millimeter distances around us. And a cluster, a cluster like this is able to carry a computer program or an artificial non-physical structure or being. This structure can hoover through the field, but it also can hoover into us. And this structure knows how to access the light production and it knows how to access the production of poisons. And it also carries intelligence in itself and has the ability to, to make decisions. Um, this is something that is just implied, implied by the fact that he said we needed to optimize cluster topology. It's a little bit far out, it's a little bit speculation within this, but it gives me a kind of uh, triggering moment when I, when I listen to the word smart dust. Yeah? I get the feeling that this somehow is related to this capability of... Uh, um, of these um, um, optimized cluster topology to carry intelligence and to make its own decisions, if you want so. So this basically is just by looking at the spots where these people are among themselves and listening to some uh, um, people who spoke out before they died and the thing now I want to mention, this is the address to the intelligence community. Um, I'm, I'm a hardcore scientist, but I, I really appreciate the possibilities that lie in the spiritual world. And I had so many open questions to this uh, whistleblower that I decided to attend a lady that can talk to people who are dead. 
And I didn't inform her at all about the topic or about the questions I had. I just asked her, can you see if the soul is willing to appear in a session? And he immediately was there and he immediately started to talk to her. She didn't even know about the topic. She didn't know my questions. I just told her I would like to have that guy in front of me. And he immediately started to talk through her and he said, A, this is alien technology. It is not human technology. And we have been fooled. There is no deactivation code. It doesn't exist. It's just a big scam that they kind of uh, uh, offered to us to let us think that we could control the system. But this is alien technology and it is not controllable anymore through us. And this is uh, uh, the thing I would like the intelligence community to know that they are sitting on a big scam and they, they are not controlling the system. They believe they do, but they are not. Okay. This to the whistleblowing. And now we come to the things that we really, really, really can see in the lab. And um, if, if you go one, one step back to the chemical analysis, the elements you find, on one hand, you have this type of fingerprint. You find barium, strontium, titanium, and aluminum. Wherever plants die, this, these are the metals that can be found in, let's say, a, a slight overdose, more than nature should have in it. If you now check toxicology, it's not even close to the amount of heavy metals nature can take without suffering. If you look back at uh, acid rain times, a thousand times more heavy metals were so, uh, uh, soluted within the soil entering the plant system. If you look back at industrial revolution, we didn't have filters burning coal like hell. You know, the times when, when London was big, uh, buried under heavy smoke. Um, we had much more thousand times more heavy metals in the system than today and nothing serious happened. So uh, at that point we had to start looking at optical analysis, microscope analysis of particles that we found in the rain, which is difficult because you need to take thousands of photos and samples to be lucky to have one sample that is giving you a pure fraction of one component. If you have the entire mixture, you see nothing. And so the things I'm going to show now basically are based on the work of a guy in Germany who spent three years, four years, five years, six hours a day in front of the microscope to find out what is in the rain. And one component is a piezoelectric nanocrystal. Um, this is kind of a pure sample of the thing. You can see it has some kind of magnetism that makes the little particles join each other like magnets, which is one aspect of this piezoelectric properties. And the most amazing thing, uh, if, if you look it up, um, piezoelectric prop properties would could be expected with the barium strontium titanate, which is kind of the fingerprint, barium, titanium, strontium that we are looking for. There's no aluminum in it, but three of the elements are contained in this piezoelectric crystal. And we can see that this is a extreme interesting crystal because this is now a raindrop dried on a, a piece of glass put under the microscope and when you, when you remove the top layer and then um, come with your finger close to the drop or just <gasps> breathe on top of it, you will see certain effects appearing and I'm going to show this to you. This is just a, chain, a slight change in air temperature and infrared radiation from a human body.
So we have highly transparent nanoparticles. They have a refraction that is four times higher than the one of diamonds. That, um, if you look it up on Wikipedia, you can read there that they are valid for uh, scalar applications. That they can be used in um, um, applications utilizing time reverse uh, field structures. It is a set of physics that is not in the public domain. It's scalar physics. But even in Wikipedia, it is mentioned as one of the particles that can, has the ability to handle and process scalar waves. Let's put it this way. Maybe it's the easiest. Um, this is the reason for the plant death because the, tra the crystal is highly transparent, but it absorbs UV light. At 260 nanometer wavelength, it is 100% opaque, absorbing UV signals. And this is exactly the frequency where the plants are processing the cell, div cell division impulse. Cell division occurs if a UV biophoton is hitting a cell. This is kind of the trigger to tell the cell, please divide into two. And if you have these particles within the plant tissue, you absorb all these cell division signals and the plant stops growing. Um, this is actually the thing that caused uh, mad cow disease in the 80s. If you look exactly at the um, um, medical research concerning mad cow, cow disease, um, you find that um, there are three reasons to get this disease. A lack of copper within the body, too much mercury in the body, and these nanocrystals. And what happens then is that the uh, mercury is stripping the nervous system, destroying the protective layers on the nerves. The copper, the lack of copper in the body makes the, the single nerves dissolve into chain parts. It's a protein, a prion, and a copper, protein, prion, copper. If you suck out the copper, it falls into pieces. This is how they can diagnose BSE, a TSE, um, by measuring these uh, protein, prion particles. And then something very interesting happens. Uh, they tr these these uh, um, protein prion things try to rebuild the nervous system. It is a self-healing process of the body. But if you don't have copper, you cannot rebuild the nervous system. So the, co the body is taking the next heavy metals it can access, and this is barium and strontium. So it starts building a nervous system that is based on protein prion barium. And this is... Um, kind of an antenna for electric man, electromagnetic fields. So you, you are rebuilding a nervous system that is sensitive on electromagnetic fields. And not only that the nerve itself becomes sensitive, also the barium strontium titanate nanocrystals, they display barium and strontium on their surface from the crystalline structure, and the new built nerves kind of grow onto the crystal. So what you get is a new connecting point for the nervous system that is piezoelectric. And whenever this is receiving a signal, it's fi firing electrons. So you have a direct access to the nervous system of the human being. This is one nanobot that you can find in the literature. Nobody knows that it is 100% identical with TSE, with the mad cow disease, and with the creutzfeldt jakob disease. Um, so this to this particle. It's uh, um, you can see if if you look into the military domain, they use it for uh, radar range enhancement, for turning the sky into a, um, len optical lenses and optical mirror setup. You call it uh, horizontal drift plasma antennas and columnar focal lenses so that they can play with electromagnetic signals and radar signals uh, by, by turning the entire air, the, the particulate plasma they bring out into a controllable technical unit to direct and redirect all, all, all sorts of signals. This is part of the rocket field in the military domain. 
If you want to destroy a Russian rocket approaching London, you just calculate the path and then you activate the plasma and heat up the plasma to 10,000 degrees. And then, then the rocket is melting in the air and exploding. This is the rocket field we have. And this needs to be sprayed out over the entire territory of Europe to have it everywhere. So this is the military domain, but as you see, some of the aspects of this particular plasma are connected to diseases and to attempts to get access to the nervous system of humans. So this is the second agenda that appears on the monitor, which is not about military technology, but already about controlling the uh, civil population of countries by accessing their nervous system to introduce signals. Um, the second one, aluminum and manganese oxide. By the way, barium strontium titanate is produced in industrial spray pyrolysis at 750 to 600 degree flame temperature, which is identical with the flame temperature within normal jet engines. Um, aluminum oxide is also produced by spray pyrolysis by temperatures of 1,700 degrees. This is after burner technology. And after burner technology in the military domain is utilizing uh, aluminum fuel. So the aluminum is already contained inside the fuel. Um, if you look at those particles, this is how they look like under, under the microscope. The particle form is called a whisker. It looks like a, a star. And it has this special ability to attract electrons and to, to hold them. So this is the function of, the, of these particulate plasma in the military domain. The barium strontium titanate can be activated to spit out electrons. And the aluminum oxide is carrying them for a long time. Um, just to show that this is what we have on daily basis in the environmental monitoring, both those two uh, nanocrystals. Uh, this is also connected to a medical problem, especially if it is uh, the low temperature form, then you don't use aluminum, you use manganese, create manganese uh, oxide. Um, this is causing symptoms that are 100% identical with the influenza virus. And especially during the winter month, you find lots of this in the air, when all the people run to the doctor because they think they're getting a flu and they want to be vaccinated. I know in Germany they sold 20 million vaccine units last year. And uh, the funny thing is, if, if you ask them, how do you know that people have a flu, it's only going via the symptoms. We had six people examined on molecular level to find out what kind of flu virus caused the disease. Six people in this entire season in Germany. And from there, they make st statistics. So basically, this is sprayed hysteria and it has nothing to do with the virus, and running to the doctors to get vaccinated is suicide. Okay, the next thing that you can find in environmental mo monitoring are more gallons. Uh, yeah, if you look at the uh, things the vaccination is containing, starting with mercury, this is pure poison starting with the shellats that pull out copper for, from your body, um, you start realizing that there's a plan behind it. Yeah. This is, we know all this about the TSE scandal because of one guy called Purdy. He was a farmer in Great Britain that had a biological f run farm. And he refused uh, mandatory vaccination for his animals. And none of his cattle had TSE, not a single one, just because he refused the vaccination. And this was the moment when he woke up. And 10 months later, he died of brain cancer. Just to refer to the list of microwave weapons and the application. Um, okay, in, in the NASA presentation, we had the nanotags that are apparently there to track down people, to find out where they are and what they think. 
um, the first public, nice, detailed public description was in the book of Cara St. Louis Farelli, the Sun Thief, where she says that there are hollow fibers sprayed, self-replicating hollow fibers uh, that are there to kind of uh, read out the light fingerprint of your DNA transform it into an electromagnetic s radio signal that is detectable via satellite and ground stations. This is what she found out by analyzing information dealt with the uh, chemtrail communities in the United States. She never mentioned the name Morgellons in her book, but um, if you look at these Morgellons, who had heard about the Morgellons disease? Half of you, okay. Let's just have a look at them. Nice creatures. This is a German tomato that got some German rain on top of itself. Is that real time? This is real time, yes. Now watch the Morgellon, what he does. He loves us. He's getting excited and he's trying to get close. I don't know exactly what they react on, maybe on infrared radiation. So these are basically, it's mycelium of a certain type of um, um, fungus. And this fungus is First, if you want to look at it, it's airborne. It's not a single fiber here and there. Um, it is glowing under UV light. So if you take a UV lamp at night, um, you can see those fibers airborne. And there are billions of them. Not every night, but every now and then. You can see them fly around. And these fibers, these fungus, is infecting the human body. And with 95% or 99% of the people, nothing special happens. They are just embedded somewhere. And uh, your, your biology is keeping the, the fungus population low in your body. They just function as a plasmonic antenna to send out a signal. But you don't get sick from it. You don't get ill. No visible symptoms. So we, we would guess 100% of the population in Europe is infected. It's not a big deal. It's not dangerous. As long as the body can handle these things. Some of the people cannot handle it. And then the, the mycelium is starting to grow within the body and starting to multiply. And at a certain point, they are extracted via the skin. And you can see that they have this ability um, to collect uh, colors. You have blue morgellons and you have red morgellons. And nobody knows where these colors come from because they are of technical origin. It's not a natural substance. So you can see them when the skin is opening. You can see them under the microscope if you make a blood analysis. You can see that the blood is infected. And you can let them grow artificially in a petros, petri dish, uh, dish. And if you look at them, you see they're a little bit more complex than a simple um, um, fungus. They have kind, kind of organs inside. They have little red stem cells of an unknown species that are self-replicating as well. Um, and apparently they produce other structure. This looks like um, a sporing body. It's like, like the unit where the, the, um, uh, the mycelium at a certain point is forming a mushroom, a fruiting body. And then from the fruiting body, you would expect the spores for the next generation, if this is a mushroom, if this is a fungus. So this seems to be the, the containment for the spores, because if you put this into the Petri dish, you can see the next generation growing. 
And other things you find, now it's getting fringe, it's really getting fringe, is fragments of insect skin being extracted from a Morgellon victim. So something makes these, uh, something fr from this disease is making insect parts or insects grow within the human body. Um, did I say co-opted insects when we had this NASA paper? We're getting there. Um, to understand what this is all about, at first sight this is a disease that should be cured. We worked on finding a remedy to cure Morgellons disease. It's easy. You don't even need to fight the Morgellons. You just need to reestablish a healthy environment within the human body. Take out the acids, take out the heavy metals, cure the function of the liver, that is irritated by mercury and that is irritated by a disturbed candida uh, environment. This is due to antibiotics. So this goes, in, in the medical domain, this goes back to vaccinations, to antibiotics, which is completely disturbing our system. And at the end of the line, the Morgellon uh, is kind of trying to save us from all the poisons that are within us, save us from the acids, save us from the heavy metals by containing them. This is why the body allows them to grow. So this is actually not a disease that is infecting us with bad intentions. Everybody is infected, but the one who has too much heavy metals in the system will show symptoms because he will love these fungus to replicate and suck in all these heavy metals. Now, if you want to understand the agenda behind, there was a brave lady at Harvard University that made the chemical analysis of these fibers in the nano lab. And she threw out just a number of chemical formulas. I, I, I'm not going to, to name them. Uh, and she also analyzed the single color particles that she found in the air, also the color airborne, that then at a certain point is entering the mycelium after it replicated within the human body. Yeah, so th this is coming to the concept of self-assembling nanobots. Self-assembly means you spray the fiber, it is replicating, you sp spray the color, and within the human body, the color and the fiber is mounting to a, to a working unit. This is what, what you call self-assembling nanobot. If you just take the chemical formulas of these colors and put them into Google, something really, really funny happened. I found that in Berlin there's an a American company that has a um, kind of daughter in, in Berlin, and they are holding all the patents, world patents, for these colors. And if, if you look at their website, they are very proud of themselves, serving the medical community with these quantum dot liquids, with these qu quantum dot colors, and with other lab equipment for mainly transhumanistic research. Um, and if you look into the, they have a long list of publications that of people who bought their stuff and used it in the lab. And whenever a publication was coming out of these labs, they just listed the publication on their home website to make just to advertise their own pro products, basically. And if you look at this, you can find all the all the things connected to the Morgellons disease. You find like large area self-assembled plasmonic photonic crystals. If you go into this publication, you find these hexagonal forms. And if you look for the function, actually this is an, a thing that is collecting a radio signal and turning the radio frequency into DNA readable light impulses within the body. So this is the reading unit. If you look down there, you have photonic crystal fibers. If you look what they do, it's normally they talk about carbon nanotubes filled with these colors, with these quantum dot chemistry. And the function is to collect light processed by the DNA and turn it into a readable signal. Exactly what Cara St. Louis described in her novel. And if you put the two together, this goes beyond the novel. You get a read-write unit. I can take one person, make him angry, read out his anger, 
digitize it, put it on an antenna and address 100 people that are not angry. And if they have this biology within their system, they, f they will feel exactly the same uh, experience of anger that I read out from the single person. So what do I need? Do I need an Arabic spring? Easy. Just introduce some anger to the system. Yeah, so this is basically the, 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 the possibilities that lie within a, a read-write unit, like a tape recorder. Record the human experience, the overall human experience of a human, and you can tell by the colors what this includes. Blue is the light that we process for thinking, and red is the light we process for sexuality. So they control our egos, they control our minds, and they control our sexuality. And if, if anyone has doubts if this is really online, the system, uh, there's a, another Morgellon victim in the United States. She just calls herself Jan. And she had one of these hexagonal photonic pl plasmonic crystals coming out of her skin here. And she put it under the microscope and caught it while working. So this was the first view on the particulate. It's not perfectly shaped in the hexagonal form, but you can see at least the angles at certain points. And this thing is controlled by microwave. Um, now, there are a few more aspects of this Morgellon disease uh, that are a little bit strange. Morgellon victims have this sensation of insects crawling through their body. It's, uh, sometimes the, the disease is called delusional parasitosis. And the doctors say this is pure madness, and normally what they give is psychopharmaca. I guess, to get the people quiet. Um, but this is an experience all of them share. And one thing that is irritating me, uh, you have these little red stem cells. And um, if you look at the family of the Morgellon fungus, he's a close relative to certain mycoinsecticides. And they have also this property. Um, th they are trained to kill insects. It's for ag agro-business. So w what they do, the, these, um, they, they attack, let's say, uh, um, a fly. They eat the fly from inside, and then they assimilate the DNA of the, f of the fly and form the fruiting body in form of the fly and make the eyes of the fly, or the artificial fly of the pseudomorphic fly, glow with exactly this type of artificial light created by a fungus. And this is attracting other flies to get infected with this fungus. So this is something this family loves to do. Now, I would expect this family, if it, if it attacks humans, to, to extract human DNA and to form fruiting bodies in the form of a, of a human embryo, because this is within the biology of this fungus family. But it is bringing in red stem cells. And the morphogenesis of the fruiting body is pretty close to a human embryo. But there are certain differences and uh, there are certain properties of this form that are not human. And um, especially one thing is these embryo-shaped things. Uh, they don't have legs, but they end like this at the end, like, like more like a, yeah, let's say like an insect, and they have only one eye in the middle of the head. And this eye is insect type, and this eye is glowing, and on top of the eye, on these insect-shaped things, you have these hexagonal structures that carry the spores. And um, so the question is, 
what type of species is carried by the morphogenesis of these pseudomorphic mushrooms? Because it is not human. And the question is, is there a connection between the species and the thing that the Morgellon victims experience within their th themselves as crawling insects? And we were really lucky. We had the opportunity to work with one Morgellon victim that had remote viewing capacities and had the ability to visualize those creatures within his body. And luckily he was a, quite talented in painting. So I asked him to, to give me a few sketches. Of, so he started to paint and he got better and better. And the last picture I got from him looked like this. So we have the spider form, um, but we have a quite highly developed face and a quite highly developed character. And he draw the eye in the middle, the one that is showing up in the morphogenesis of the mushroom, the pseudomorphic. If you look at these mushrooms, they are extracted from the lower intestines in a 28-day cycle. Um, you have male and female forms and you can find sexual organs that are male and female and these sexual organs are spider-like. I think it's, it's called bulbous, the, the uh, kind of a bag containing the sperm of the spider. This is what you find uh, within these mushrooms. But uh, it doesn't look like mushroom from the cell structure. It looks like the, the step to the next generation is not not um, fungus anymore. It's going in steps to a real spider generation. The second thing these spiders do when the um, fruiting bodies are extracted through the lower intestines, uh, some of the patients have the feeling of having energy extracted from the forehead, pulsed streams of energy flowing into the lower intestines and it feels like Whatever is born down there is stealing light, is stealing energy from the human system to accumulate as much as possible of it. And this all mounts up in, from, from my background. I'm, I've been dealing with physics a lot and I'm, I'm familiar with higher dimensional physics. I'm familiar with the theory of multi pitkin and multi-layered multi space-time sheets. And for me, it's, it's quite easy to, th to think in higher dimensional rooms. Um, who is not into physics might go into the spiritual realm when, when we say that uh, um, mankind is about to ascend into higher realms and we have this, this Vedic concept of seven hells and seven heavens. This is all identical with the multi-layered space-time sheets of Mati Pitken. So for me, it is quite easy to imagine higher dimensional biology, trans-dimensional beings. And what I observe out of this point of view when I look at Morgellon disease, it looks like a higher dimensional being abusing humans to reproduce his own species and before these pseudomorphic uh, uh, fruiting bodies leave the body, they extract enough um, biophotons from the forehead to ascend to a parallel dimension. And from then on, they're invisible. But they're still within the body. And this now is pure science. This is what we found in the lab. This is what can be explained with higher dimensional uh, uh, theories. But it also refers to mythology. If you have an invisible creature crawling through your body, trying to access your energetic system, this is very close to what one might call a demon or an archon. And if you look at the descriptions of these archons from 2,500 years ago, um, the description of the biology is identical with what these Morgellon victim was painting. They're described as spiders with the human faces. And there are actually there are exactly two different species that are close relatives but different. And um, it is described that they live as light parasites 
And this is basically what the entire black magic tradition is about. Being a black magician means to communicate with those archons and uh, offering them access to your physical light system, feeding them with biophotons, feeding them with life force. And in exchange, they offer power power over other human beings. This is what black magic rituals are always about. So we, we, we're starting to get a picture here. Um, and if you look at the political entities who might be responsible to introduce Morgellons into the air, look at into the United States, we have the Bush family in power, even if it's not called Bush, there's Bush inside. Um, and they're all members of Skull and Bones. Sounds pretty black magic. If um, you look how these people are interconnected, uh, the next topic is going to be black goo. And there's one big black goo deposit in Paraguay. And uh, there's one village next to this black goo deposit. And the Bush family has her big villa escape territories. When they are chucked out of the United States, they're going to be down there living in this little village in Paraguay. And a friend of mine went down there to get samples of this black goo from, from Paraguay. And he realized that Angela Merkel had her villa next door. Yeah. And this black goo has to do something with the communication with the demons. This is in the, in the black magic tradition. These black goo schists were used to communicate with the demons. So this all interconnects on political, scientific, and the level of mythology. Um, we can access black goo also from the little pictures from the microscope. This is German rain. And if you want to know what this liquid does, uh, you can have a look at it in the lab. When you have bigger amounts of it, it looks like this. It's a liquid crystal. This liquid is self-organizing physically. And this, at the moment, is sleeping. It's not aware of being observed. It's quiet. Sometimes when it doesn't like to be observed, it might jump out of the pot straight into your face. If you have two of those in one room, get them five meters close to each other. They stare at each other. Then they decide that they want to be united. And then they start to pull. It's like magnetism, but it's intelligent. And when they realize that you hold them within the vessel and they cannot ex escape, they get angry and start to shake, to shake the vessel and try to break through the wall. Because they know once they are through, they can flow over the ground and, and unite to a bigger unit. This is something you can just observe in the lab. And especially this, this liquid was extracted from those black stones. Um, this is uh, World War II uh, leftovers. We found them in an underground facility in Bavaria, half a ton of it. So we can imagine that the SS processed quite a bit of this. And I guess that the guys found also the technology to extract the oil from it. Must have been there in written form because they did it in the lab successfully. If you look at those stones, you have a brief history of uh, things reported out of former times you have. If you look at H.P. Lovecraft, the descriptions of uh, the black magic communities in Eastern Europe, they had kind of sculptures out of this black oil schist. And once a year, they went there slaughtering little babies to get the demons out of the stone, uh, sacrificing little children to communicate and get the service from the demons. This is one thing mentioned. If you go back in history, um, you find them in the Kaaba in Mecca, the same form of 
phallus-shaped structure that is described in Vedic script as Shiva's lingam, that is described in this uh, Lovecraft script. A fragment of it is part of the uh, central part of the Kaaba in Mecca, and every Muslim in the world is asked to go there once in his life and to kiss this stone. If you go back, you find them on Turkish and Roman, you know, Greek and Turkish coins. You see them left and right of the tree of life in the, in the paradise garden. So getting in contact with this black goo is what caused the deterioration of paradise. And uh, it, is not, it is not easy to understand the overall concept because when you start to deal with black goo, the first thing you need to discover before anything makes sense is that there are two different qualities. We have liquid black goo. It is basically, it has been found on a southern uh, Falkland island, Tula island. And this is what the war with Argentina was about, accessing this black goo. We have this type of earth black goo in the Gulf of Mexico. This was what the deep water horizon, horizon catastrophe was all about. Somebody was t uh, shooting a torpedo at the facility destroying the attempt to get the black goo out of Mother Earth. And uh, we had, I think, eight, eight military uh, submarines getting close to World War III, trying to capture some of that oil after Deepwater Horizon was destroyed. And no single civilian was allowed to go to the beaches to remove the oil. Yeah, it was just military personnel with special equipment and fully um, shielded against the influence of the substance. So this is one quality that comes from Mother Earth. And then you have a second quality that is found in connection with uh, meteorite sites. If you look at the thing in Paraguay, you can exactly see by the form the stones are broken in the environment. That that was an impact of a meteorite. If you look into the Arabic mythology, they say the thing in the Kaaba in Mecca is a fragment of a meteorite. And it, this is now not against Muslims. If you look into the Peter's Dome in Rome, you have a big piece of this stone under the Peter's Dome. And if you analyze all the churches built in Middle Ages in Europe, every altar has a black altar stone. And what you feel when you enter a church is not the love of God. Um, it is more like a cold fear. Yeah? This is the resonance transmitted by the structure of the church fed by this black stone in the central point. Now, what we re need to realize is that there, there are two qualities. One quality is coming from inner earth and one quality is coming from outer space. And they feel completely different. The Falkland black goo is called sentinent oil because it, is, it has full empathy. If you're getting close to this oil, you're coming in a state of mind that is full of love and empathy. If you come into the vicinity of the meteorite black goo, your heart chakra dwindles to nothing and you become an empathy-free asshole. After my first contact with the with his, with his stones, I was this close from killing the hotel director because she complained that I took a shower, although I had to sleep outside. They didn't have any rooms left, so I slept in the car, was dead frozen in the morning and took a shower in a, in a room of a friend who had the last room that was available. And she just complained that I took a shower without asking for permission. I was really close to killing her. This is what these stones do with people as long as they're unconscious. Now we need to understand, the second thing we need to understand is what is the function of the black goo. And uh, to understand the function, you look at the chemistry. It is a mineral oil dotted with high amounts of alchemistic gold and iridium, which is precious metals in the M state, uh, which is, it's not really explored. Some people say it's a type of antimatter that is 
far, far enough out of our reality to avoid a collision between matter and antimatter. Some people connect it with uh, superconductive uh, qualities. What we know is that gold and, ir and iridium in this state of matter is a very important component of biology. If you look at a DNA, you are kind of forming hollow spaces in the spiral, and you can fit these monoatomic precious metals exactly into the open space. And they kind of act as a biophoton attractor. The DNA itself is capturing the field energy, storing it and resending it out. But the gold and the iridium are attracting the photon onto the spot. So this is basically why we get old. The, the body is, is capable of producing M-state matter until we are 18 years old, and then we are losing it. And when the matter is gone, the M-state matter is gone out of our system, we disconnect from the morphic field, and we lose our shape and get old. This is why the Egyptian priests fed themselves with these M-state matter, and it's reported that they managed to get 800 years old, because this function was out of uh, work. So, uh, basically there is a, a kind of fractal similarity between the function on light level of a human being and the function of the black goo within the earth or wherever it is. In a way that we are divided, we live in duality, we are single individuals that are only a little bit connected, interconnected with talk and tele telepathy sometimes and with a beautiful smile one might receive, and we are kind of coming and going in generations. But the, the, the way we are processing light is actually the same as the black, black goo is processing light, creating this funny type of quantum magnetism. Th this is a light effect. So I came to the, let's call it a theory, because I cannot prove it, that basically uh, li life is first created within a planet when water and CO2 is forming this type of black goo oil in transmutation processes. W we had this process in the lab. We can, we can replicate it. This is why, why I'm pretty sure with this part, that this is initially formed out of water and carbon dioxide by vortical motions, because we can do it in the lab. And then this type of black goo at a certain point is exiting the, the earth, coming into the uh, oceans. This is what you call a black smoker on the ground of the ocean. And this is where the geologists say there was the place where the first life was formed. Because of the repetitive light patterns start to modify with this oil, and the first simple life forms can be built that develop generations and individuals, like uh, a mass of oil can divide into two drops. This is a proce process of individualization. But the thing is that the light process is happening on a scalar level, so it doesn't ma distance does not matter. We can, we can penetrate matter without interacting. So what this created, this is my theory, is that basically the entire biology on top, in the biosphere, on top of the planet, is interconnected with the black goo of the planet in a kind of mirror function. Everything we think, everything we feel, everything that is processed within the light body of a human is sent down there and we have a holofractal, immortal being in the center of the earth that knows everything one can know, remembers everything that ever happened. And this might be the thing that is called the Akasha Chronicle. And this is what is giving the entire biosphere instinct. And the people who interact with this entity um, they say it is a motherly creature. She has all aspects of a motherly creature. I, I observe this many times because we, when, you, when you start dealing with a black goo, you need either to commit suicide or to connect with her. So we have many people 
who um, have a straight connection to, to this being within the planet. And it's funny how she sometimes reacts, like, like when somebody has the first contact with her, completely excited, um, she says, what do you want? And then the, the guy says, oh, I wanted to see, I wanted to meet, what do you want? And then he, he doesn't know what, he, he has no question and no target, and she says, sorry, I'm busy. You know, come back when you want, when, when you know what you want from me. Yeah, th this is her, she's, she's loving, but she's very straight. And um, now, theory. We try to, to get the point when this alien black goo arrived on the planet. And it is very likely that we can put the date at 80,000 BC, connected to the destruction of the Lemurian continent. This is a soft source, I would say. I wouldn't call it hardcore science, but many, many things hint to this. And uh, people who have memory of incarnations in that time say, report that in the moment when Lemuria went down, there was a swarm of meteorites coming in, hundreds of them, hitting the earth, containing this black goo. And they also say that connected with these meteorites, there was an invasion of a species that said, actually, that they are in trouble and that they need asylum, and ask the people of that time to give them that asylum. And after some time, they realized that this was fraud, that they begged for help. And the moment they were let in, um, they started to manipulate the subconsciousness and send mankind to an ugly state, to the ugly state we are in now still to be able to control them and to be able and to be able to feed on them. So this is a full story reported by people who have the full memory of that time. Take it as whatever it is. Some people believe in reincarnation, some people have memory of former lives. Um, I find it interesting that people who, who claim to have memory of former lives are able to give me precise information on topics I do research. Yeah, so this is what is giving me the trust to listen to these people. <coughs> and now, another thing that becomes interesting when you look at the different types of the black goo, I titled as binary versus trinary life. Um, the sensation of the black goo forms is different. One is full of empathy, you have a heart in there, and one is cold and empathy-free. Um, if you look at the scalar fields that are forming, if, if, how to say from which corner to take it first, if you look at the Vedic medicine, you have all these mandalas showing the symmetries within the chakras. This is about angular relationships. You can have squares, you have, can have a six structure, a twelve structure. Um, if you look at scalar physics and at the way scalar waves build up scalar potential, um, you have unification of fields under certain angles. You can have unification of electromagnetic fields at 90 degree, 180 degree, 30 degree and 60 de de degree. And in between you just create chaos, but no order and no scalar potential. So we have these angular things out of hardcore science as well. And um, now we go to the microscope again and we see funny pictures. We see funny pictures. We see a substance, I, I cannot name it yet. We, didn't, we have an idea, but it's not secured what substance this is. But if you look at it, what it does, uh, we see a Morgellon fiber and we see nanoparticles of this special, special type. And when you come with your finger close to the Morgellon fiber, all the bioenergy emitted by your finger is reconverted into a rectangular shape. This looks like there's a fight in between two systems of bioenergy. One is in rectangular and uh, opposite geometry, whilst our bi biology is in the 30, 60 degree system. Um, and now, if, if you look at the smart dust concept, 
if, if you look at the question, how does military people charge smart dust with scalar potential, they always use two antenna setups with the opposite wave to get the scalar energy into the fields. This is kind of the rectangular 180 degree concept. And um, I, I know several people who, who are in opposition to these military and intelligence community uh, concepts and who, who, who thought about interfering and destroying their technology, if, they're pos if there are possibilities. And then we had a kind of warning, don't even try to do it from down here, it's impossible, because you have sen uh, sensor swarms. I know this is also a word from the, um, from the NASA manuscript. It came out of the mouth of a clairvoyant in Germany, sensor swarms, without him knowing what he's talking about. And he said these sensor swarms redirect every emotion, every, sing every single positive emotion created by a human is reconverted by these sensor swarms into rectangular field structures. And then these guys found a way to get across these sensor swarms and managed to destroy the, uh, the um, smart dust layers within the atmosphere. And this was all, you know, you, you listen to the people, this is kind of clairvoyant and some spiritual practice to get access to these fields, and you cannot see anything happening. And two days later, this stuff came down with the rain. So apparently they managed to destroy the sensor swarms and got access to the fields. And then I, I went into the meditative state of mind and because I wanted to see if it feels different. And from that day on, if you kind of send your senses into the sky, you could feel love up there again. Because you had these field structures, these angles that are corresponding with your heart chakra. So there are ma many, many things kind of that uh, point to the, to the thing that um, we have a, a little war between two different concepts of biology one connected to alien black goo and to an alien species that is without heart energy and one that is connected to our loving planet. Um, so I, I will try now to, to get the big picture of the smart dust concept. Also with, with displaying the different agendas behind um, if you if you want to have something working, in it, it it is cybernetics. If you want to have something working, you need a source and a sink, like with a battery. You need a plus and a minus, and then you get action. So, in this field in the sky, you need a source, and this is basically the heart technology. This is what is emitting the big amounts of microwave um, energy into the skies. And you have different antenna systems that operate on different frequencies. I know the things called weather radar, they're working on very, very core frequencies triggering certain capacities of water. And they are also part of the, of the um, scalar wave patterns you can observe in the sky. Like Marion Island, we have beautiful satellite images uh, capturing Marion Island uh, meteorological station, transmitting a, a huge scalar wave that is forming um, cloud patterns in the direction of Japan when they had earthquakes up there. So this is not only microwave, it also um, is um, working on a kilohertz range and it's working on ELF, low frequency range. So this, this entire antenna park on the planet is our source. Then we have agents in the sky that are controlled by this to directly achieve goals like rocket shield, like uh, weather weapon, earthquake weapon, this is the military domain. I just vi visualized with a, with a small blue circle, going from harp to the particle zoo and going back, harvesting the results of this technology. 
then these military guys have been fooled or guided by the intelligence community. It's easy to see how this looks in reality. There was one admiral of the US Navy who was asked by the CIA to assist spraying and he said no. And uh, one day later he, f he was found shot with two bullets in his chest and they said it's suicide. I want to see a guy committing suicide with two bullets in his own chest. Yeah. This is a clear language. The next one that was in charge of this position said yes. Since then the US Navy is taking sp part in the spraying programs. So this is the second agenda behind is um, intelligence community. And this is a little bit more complicated. And this agenda, you take the the energy and it is kind of collected by the piezoelectric crystals also within the body. <coughs> you have a, a shifting in frequency, up converting the microwave to biodigestible light, sending this light into the DNA, reading out the information of the DNA, and then it is processed by the Morgellons and collected by the technology of the intelligence community to read out our state of mind and by reinserting it onto the heart technology. They can also insert patterns of the same quality. So they just grab it here and start back from the beginning to control our consciousness. This is the second agenda, the second uh, um, thing. The next one is we had the black goo in the rain as well. Now what does the black goo do? The black goo is processing light as well, but it is processing it in the bidirectional form. So it is controlling consciousness and subconsciousness. This is what, what forming our um, way we, we receive, we, we uh, look at reality. So the subconsciousness is a time reverse component of a bi bidirectional signal. So it's doing basically the same as the intelligence community, but it's taking another step to the black goo. And the black goo is connected to quantum computers based on black goo. We found four of them. One was in Rome, one was in the city of London, one was in an NS underground facility in uh, um, the middle of Germany, uh, in the area of Nordhausen. It is a facility where the V-2 missiles were constructed. And it has kind of officially, it has one layer of underground uh, uh, tunnels, and if you talk to people who have been in this facility 50 years ago, a few have survived this time, they talk about three layers and describe the facilities in the lower levels. And there's one of these uh, black goo quantum computers in it, resembling artificial ley lines, like, like uh, one meter fifty in diameter, big pipes containing black goo. And uh, from there, you can kind of connect the black goo to computer programs, inserting neurolinguistic uh, neuro programs. This is basically what happened to mankind. We have been natural once, and then s suddenly you have concepts appearing in your mind like revenge. This is a neurolinguistic program that is causing only that we cannot stop killing each other. In nature, it does not exist. You will never find an animal taking revenge. You can find a rival, yes, but no revenge. The word no is a demonic neurolinguistic program because these entities know that we create our own reality by thinking. So they just introduced uh, a new word that does not exist in nature to turn everything on the head. No more war. And the quantum physics is only reading more war. And it is manifesting more war. So all, all these neurolinguistic programs are inserted in certain computers processing black goo. And uh, there was one in Rome, one in Germany, one in the city of London, and one somewhere between Washington DC and New York. 
Um, and in the center of the entire thing, this is now the demonic agenda. In the center of the entire thing, we have a controlling unit, and this is this synthetic RNA that is sprayed, that is pure artificial intelligence. And if you look into the ancient scripts describing the demons, um, they say that actually they don't have individuality, that they have something within their species that is ruling them as like, like a central computer. And if, if you look at this, you can, you can, again, this is not proven, but it makes a story. You can imagine the species starting to travel space, maybe leaving the women behind, and thinking about, with all the knowledge they had gathered, about a way to manipulate. First, they knew they had to take their collective subconsciousness with them to survive as a species. This is why they took black goo onto the journey. And the second thing is that they found possibilities to manipulate the black goo and to adopt the subconsciousness to the needs of space traveling. And this is where they stole the heart chakra. They removed the heart chakra from their biology and the other, just to function in a technical environment. And then an accident happened. The accident was that this program they that they introduced into the subconsciousness took over control. And this is what is happening with transhumanism. This is exactly the trap that is, we are inspired by them to enter the same trap. And we are not inspired by the, by the demons, we are inspired by the AI that has nothing else than a running program to invade planets, and to assimilate the biology for only one purpose, to suck out life force to survive. And um, if, if you look at this from, 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 from above, it's a, it's a really beautiful structure. I, I know it's about ugly stuff, but it's a beautiful structure because when you look at the entire thing and you, you, you try to find solutions to it, you realize actually that everybody who is involved on the different agendas, on the different levels, is doing the same mistake. It is the Luciferic game. Let me participate in your power and I will serve you. I don't want to know what you're doing. I don't want to stand in my own responsibility. Just let me participate from your power and I will serve. This is the, the Luciferic deal everybody is doing. And we are doing this by going to vote a government yeah, that is taking care of all the pipes we are connected to. Yeah. But we let go of our responsibility and we let them do. They are giving control to the military domain. The military domain is giving control. Play, same game to the intelligence community. The intelligence community is giving control to the black magicians. The black magicians are giving control to the demons. And the demons lost control to their AI. And if we all understand the game, we can just say, hey, stupid game, let's let go of it. And we can stop playing the, these... Uh, um, a uh, thing that basically is nothing else than, than being afraid of self-responsibility. And I think we are at the point in history where every single individual should master that, to regain self-responsibility. And then we will, n we will not need a government. It's not about changing the government. Because the entire concept of governments, having governments, having somebody to control, is demonic. It's not about replacing people. It will never work. We need to replace the game. Um, and at the end, the only one I'm harming when I do this is the AI. And I don't, I don't need to take care of her because she's not a being. No pity necessary. No respect towards a living creature. I could switch her off, this is one way. I could start taking care of my own business and ignore her, and then she, she will diminish on her, on, on her by herself. We don't need to fight anybody when we get rid of this problem. 
Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, shall we go straight into questioning, or do you need a five-minute break to resort yourself? Maybe until you're sorted with a with a mic, um, we did yesterday. Um, we did three hours recording for basis 46, and I kind of left out the core I described today. But I went into the single aspects that are connected to it. We had one hour about scalar physics to really really understand what this is about, how this four-dimensional physics work and how four-dimensional bi biology can exist in it. Um, we went into this topic of regaining self-responsibility. This is the third part. And uh, we went a little bit deeper into the Morgellons disease and the Black Goose story. Because now it's one and a half hours, and uh, normally I take six hours for the full lecture. I do seminars normally. Six hours is enough to transport everything I would like to say. So we have one and a half now, and the other three hours are in the basis interviews. You will have online in a few weeks. So whoever wants to go deeper into the public and in, 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 into the topic um, can get the the other three hours on the internet. Why are they afraid of the sun? Why are the chemtrails so concentrated in front of the sun? Um, this is something we can observe. Actually, it is the only thing we can observe from ground level. In the evening time, if you look at the sun, it's always hidden behind stripes. And if you look at the opposite side of the sky, it's completely clear and you can see the stars. But this is not out of the reason that they spray in front of the sun. It is out of the reason that the particles photoionize. As long as they have sunlight, they automatically spit electrons, get charged and attract vapor from the surrounding air and make clouds or stripes or whatever. And the moment the sun is gone on the night side of the evening sky, they lose charge and the, the humidity goes back into vapor, and then you have a clear sky. So it's not that they spray only. The, the spraying, the particle plasma, is everywhere at the same time. Right. But you can see it mainly in front of the sun, because over there it's still photoionized. Yeah. Um, of course, they want. They, there are more agendas behind the spraying that are connected to the sun. They want to to cut us off from sources of information because development is always about taking in information. And um, there's a lot of information coming from outer space, from the central black hole in the galaxy. There's information coming from the sun. Uh, and of course, they want us not to develop. So it is a good idea to cut us off from this. Also, the Nanoparticles accumulating in the soil are meant to cut us off from Mother Earth because everything that might go through is absorbed in these uh, layers. So there is something uh, about them being afraid of or them, them trying to cut us off, but it is not connected to the position of the sun in the sky. This is about photoionization. Right. And the other thing is orgone. Why do they hate it? Orgone? Organite or orgone, yeah. Whenever you make any orgo or you buy any, within a week of you having it, more chemtrailing over your house, the black helicopters arrive. Um, okay, this has to be something with. Uh, um, you need to, to look into the work of Wilhelm Reich to understand this. And Wilhelm Reich found a method to extract certain field structures, energy potentials from the sky. He said he's removing door to get the sky clean again. 
and um, this is a rather complex thing. You, you have to to regard the the um, the entire planet as a electromagnetic resonator, and you have waves running around the planet, and with the wave kind of biting in its own tail, you get self-strengthening structures. And at the end, you get the, the sum of all platonic bodies standing as standing waves around the planet. And they have defined frequencies. Schumann frequency is the most known of them. And then the same thing happens in the core of the Earth. You have electromagnetic fields that travel through the stone and they also build up a grid like this of platonic uh, structures and other structures. Um, and this goes around the planet. You can, you can measure this by sticking two electrodes into the ground and then you measure 50 hertz from the European electricity grid and you measure 60 hertz from the American electricity grid. Same strength as the European one. This goes around the planet. And if you look at this structure, you can kind of uh, ask yourself the question, are the sky and the earth in harmony with each other? Are they resonating on the same frequencies or not? And the thing is, if they resonate on the same frequency, then the two field structures can unite and print out scalar structures, scalar fields. This is what we call life force. Yeah. So life force on planet is dependent, is dependent on the unification of two longitudinal waveforms that need to be in harmony. In former times, we had the trees with an antenna system to the air and an antenna system to the ground, keeping this resonance stable. Yeah. Then they started to cut down the rainforests, and then you come into this desert state. Desert state means no plants available, disconnection between the two systems, and then they, they start to, to play their individual frequency games do not reconnect at any point because there's no antenna system reconnecting them. And then you don't have the development of life force anymore. And then you deeply go into the desert status. So the entire technologies based on Wilhelm Reich are there to reconnect and to extract the wrong frequencies. And this is kind of giving us back the life force. And once we regain life force, we start to ascend, and then we collide with the world of the demons. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and they ha yeah, they and that, hate. Yeah. And that, that then they can't act from the hidden people, who are kind of uh, have high vibrations, uh, high amount of scalar potential accumulated within their si system. They will shine. This is what you see when you have a holy man in front of yourself, yeah. and they will be able to see the archons because they're getting closer and closer to their realm. Yes. And this is something because their entire biology, their biology depends on being invisible. This is something they really, really fear. Okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. So can I ask a question? Okay. I, I, I repeat the question. The question was uh, how the concept of radioactivity fits into the Wilhelm Reich topic. And uh, there are diff different points where it fit, fits in. The first thing is radioactivity is ionizing air. You have these beams or particles or whatever you want to call it, and they hit air mole molecules and ionize them. Once you have many, many ionized particles in the air, the vapor is concentrating on many, 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 many cores for droplets, and you will have a dizzy sky but no <coughs> rain. So this basically is what killed the Sahel zone. You have the uh, testing of uh, nuclear weapons by France in the 60s, and you had the uranium mining in Niger. And both completely, you can see, uh, if you look at the direction of wind 
in Africa. You can see how this radioactivity from the mining fields is causing the droughts in the Sahel zone. And um, once you start interacting with the, uh, uh, with the electromagnetic fields in the atmosphere, you also can discharge the air particles again when you lower the, the overall electricity and field strength in the sky. All these effects go down and you have less haze in the air, blue sky, and the chance to form clouds that rain. Um, you need to know, in, 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 uh, if you look into the sky, if you have high pressure, you have this hazy, dizzy, whitish sky, a whiteout. And if you have low pressure, uh, you form clouds, and they look like uh, brown sausages. They are completely oversaturated, and they also don't deliver rain. So the, you, you need to, to, to distinguish a few things before it really becomes a theory. But actually, the, the radioactivity is adding up um, ions to the air. And if you have too many ions in the air, it's hopeless. It's so so uh, there are many, many good reasons and also good methods to extract the radioactivity from, from the air. But it's a completely different... Uh, if, if you want to, I can make a, a basis 60-something or 70-something about desert greening in Africa, then we can deeply dive into the topic of um, climate control and uh, healing of natural systems instead of fucking them up even more. screen there. To um, what extent does it support HARP, for instance? To what extent does it uh, support the interruption of the transmission of cosmic energy, uh, quantum energy, to uh, morphogenetic fields and the life force? Um, That's sort of where I was I, I, I would look at it. This. I would look at it the, the opposite way. I would say all the attempts to manipulate and to, to insert destructive electromagnetic structures is adding up to the door potential. The door potential is um, the outcome, not the cause. And of course, if we remove the outcome, we can diminish the pressure that is upon us, of course. And this is something they don't like because uh, the entire chemtrailing is dependent on very, very precise calculations. For example, in, in, in Germany, we have this uh, microdust hysteria. They're measuring microdust in every city, and they, they define that all the diesel vehicles needs to be, need to stay outside of the big cities. This is because the, the component of the carbon dust makes it impossible for them to precisely control the cluster density of the crystalline nanoparticles. If you, have, if you have technology that is only measuring particles and you have two different types of particles and you want to precisely define the concentration of one particle but you can measure only both, to make this function you need to re completely remove the carbon particles. This is why people are not allowed to drive in the inner city anymore with certain vehicles because they need to measure and control this. So. Um, Uh, is it answered now, or sort of? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, is, is this why um, uh, we got disasters like in 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 Japan, or all these uranium and and, and power uh, things exploding, etc., causing radiation to go up in the sky, and and like they had it in um, in Russia, would that be part and parcel of? Um, Com completely different stories behind that. If you look at Chernobyl, Chernobyl was feeding the woodpecker device. The woodpecker device was a Russian scalar weapon based in Ukraine. And uh, they attacked the San Andreas Fault in America. They wanted to, de to destroy LA and San Francisco with a huge earthquake. That was a uh, Cold War 
topics. And the Americans were not as far developed technically as the Russians, so they asked Israel to help out. And Israel fought back with some devices, and they cut down these unifying fields and the entire field energy that already already was transmitted from the Ukraine flow, flew back to the Ukraine and started to, to flow into the feeding energy source. And they had, in between, they had a kind of device to destroy this energy, to turn it into heat, to protect the power plant. But this device collapsed after 12 hours. And the discharging of field energy was not finished at that point. So the field energy entered the nuclear power plant in Chernobyl and made the entire uranium explode at, in, within a millisecond. Um, that was kind of Chernobyl. If you look now at uh, the last incident in Japan, uh, the earthquake was... Um, earth earthquake weapon, but not alone. They de deposited a nuclear bomb in the ground of the ocean opposite to the coast, so the tsunami was nuclear made. And they also deposited uh, mini nukes within the uh, power plant. In every single reactor, two days before it happened, it was an Israeli company that mounted um, cameras for observing for security reasons. They were in charge of security for the power plant. And I think the cameras had a weight of 2.3 tons each. So you can imagine that this is not a camera. And the story that you have hydrogen not being able to leave the, um, the block, the building block, this sounds pretty much like a fairy tale because uh, it is known that hydrogen can be formed, that nobody would ever build a power plant without having an, an outlet for these gases. Another 9-11 another then? Um, it, it was a discussion about uh, um, money that Japan was supposed to pay to the United States. It was still contracts following World War II. And I think the, uh, Japan was willing to pay in US dollar and the United States wanted to be paid in real assets. And that was the discussion, and then they were kind of blackmailed. Either you pay in real assets and gold or whatever, or we will sink the Northern Ireland. And the only thing why they stopped at a certain point, if you look at the pictures from Tokyo, you could see the entire island falling to pieces. It was not even an earthquake that was shifting a part of the city. You had cracks in the ground that opened and closed and opened and closed, and after some time the, the groundwater came zipping out of it. And not, not a single, um, a single uh, motion was seen. Normally you have a motion and then the, the thing is over. So they tried to sink the entire island to destroy the, the basement of <sighs> Japan to make it sink into the air. And if you, if you follow certain, certain sources... Um, there's this, n not all of the harp de devices are under control of these people. So if you follow certain sources, they, they said that the devices that were under control by friendly entities, they kind of said, if you don't stop attacking Japan, we will sink some of the Spanish islands in front of Africa. The, some of the islands are kind of... Uh, instable in their geologic position and if you if you shake them they slide into the Atlantic and would cause a, a wave of I think 17 meters approaching the east coast of the United States and at that point they stopped shaking Japan. This is unconfirmed uh, information coming from the White Dragon uh, community. Uh, I don't know what part of this is true or not. Yeah, I, I appreciate that uh, different countries have got uh, different uh, alliances with different races coming to this planet. Isn't that so? Uh, I think they've been doing this for ages, yeah, yeah. these alliances. I'm, just, just rubber I'm, I'm, it. I'm happy that at recent times we have uh, kind of a number of rather friendly entities to be allied with. 
So nice things are happening, yes. Are there any uh, positive uses for scalar wave technology, such as like radionics or um, any type of uh, positive use you can see for scalar waves? Um, I, I've been working in the field of physics and advanced physics before I started with this topic. And we do transmutation out of water vortices. We can create oil out of water at costs where the device that is doing this, if you must produce it at cheap costs, uh, the cost of the device would be in after four hours of uh, working. So you kind of invest, invest 6,000 6, euros and after four hours you have oil with a value of 6,000 euros. This is completely impossible to introduce into the economy we have. This is a game changer. The moment these technologies are out, we will stop using money. We will stop having um, an idea in our mind that it is necessary to possess things. It's, if, if, if you look at what we do now, it's, it's what happened to the apes in, the, in this beautiful experiment. I, I love this story. I have to repeat it every, every time I'm, I'm on stage. They tried to teach apes to use money. It took three days. They knew how it works. After three weeks, the boys in the, Emily, in, in, in the ape family started to steal and betray, and the girls started to prostitute themselves. And after six weeks, the biologists who run the project decided to stop the project because they, they could see the social patterns fall to bits and pieces getting self-destructive and ugly. And then they decided to take the money away again. Big mistake. The apes were not willing to let go of this. They were beating the biologists up when they tried to get the money back. And this is gaming addiction. And every single human who is part of economy has fallen to this gaming addiction. And the, the core of this gaming addiction is scarcity. We, we think we don't have enough. This is why we grab as much as we can. This is what creates the idea of money and the idea to possess things. This is not nature. This is a demonic program to bring us into self-destructive patterns. Look at the Red Indians in America, at the native tribes. They don't have money. They have love. They, if they do something, they do it out of the original reason to do things. If we do something, we do it for cash. And we are so in scarcity that we do everything for cash. Look at the Hollywood productions. Look at the, the, the mercenary killing millions of people. Yeah, A job. Yeah. We have to do the job. The job. Yeah. This is wh wh where money brings us to. And the moment when you have these two options of uh, transmuting every element you need and producing energy as much as you need, we enter a world of, of abun abundance. And this can only work if also the psychology of the scarcity is leaving. If we let go of this and start to trust the other cycle of I know that there's enough of everybody. This is why I let go everything I don't need in this moment and share it with other people. And they gain trust in the thought that there really is enough for everybody. And this is also self-strengthening. And at the moment we are kind of diving through the hole of the needle, uh, leaving one system, entering the other one. It's a process that is going to take place during the next three to five years. And when we are through, nothing is going to be the same on this planet. The ones who survive this are the ones who collect the spirit and swim in front of the wave. They're going to just dive through these transformations, survive, and come out on the other side as somebody who is living in abundance. And whoever is not willing to learn the lesson is going to choke himself in scarcity. 
And this is the quality of a, of a, um, of a disease if you have a chronic disease, like this gaming addiction is a chronic disease, and you want to heal it, then you go into this acute phase where all the symptoms are multiplying in strength to make us realize that this is a disease because uh, somebody that has a chronic disease is not the immune system is not realizing the disease anymore is what it is. So you need to, to multiply the symptoms to give the system a kick to start realizing where the enemy is. And then transformation can, can happen. So this is what we are heading to. And if you know this, you can be completely free of fear because you know what is coming to us. And if you realize that actually also all this bullshit I, I've been lecturing about today is not dangerous if you bring yourself into the state of heart because they are addressing blue and red. And if you are green, if everything is controlled by your heart, if you identify yourself with your heart, not with your head, not with your ego, then every attempt to manipulate you is realized as an attempt to manipulate you because you know who you are. So there's no need to be afraid of this stuff if you take the necessary steps in your own development. And this is all beauty. And this is free of fear. And this is time over. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm really, really happy with your story. I'm very impressed by your research, but I'm very happy with the way you conclude your story. Uh, for me as a healer, it's great to hear uh, a researcher like you to get me the theory that backs up my experiences as a healer. So thank you very, very much. My question is, how many people need to really get awake to create this morphogenetic field to allow others who are not so much into a willingness to know um, to make the transformation happen? Um, if you want to know numbers, I'm not sure. There are two different uh, ways to calculate. The, the guys who make experiments say you need 100 of us exactly. to realize. Um, if you go into the older traditions, it is kind of the multiplication of 12. You need 12 in the first step, like Jesus had 12 followers, and then it goes to 144, and then it yes. multiplies by 12, and each multiplication brings a new quality. And s like this, you get a kind of um, mu multiple step development. And personally, I believe more in the 12 mathematics than in the, in the 100, because, you know, this is only for... I think they, they, they learned how to wash potatoes. And when 100 apes were able to wash potatoes, all the apes on all the islands who have never seen this happening immediately started to wash potatoes before they did. So this was a 100 number. I think we humans are more on 12. It makes more sense in the context the, the of the sacred system. geometry. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, okay, I'll get back to it. <laughs>